He has the power to be anywhere and nowhere, miles away and right beside you, breathing down your neck. He terrorizes at women. Why not? After all, what will you do? You have the power to govern yourself, free from responsibility. Perhaps the most chilling tale of all, this monster is the monster within each of us. The Invisible Man. Suddenly I realized the power I held to make the world grovel at my feet. I shall offer my secret to the world with all its terrible power. In 1931, while filming was underway for Frankenstein, Universal Pictures went to work securing the rights to another classic story. With the rights to H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man, director James Whale signed on to direct, and with star Boris Karloff hot off of two massive successes, Bringing this film to the silver screen should have been a dream, but it turned out to be more like a nightmare. Part of the rights deal included that Wells himself retained final approval over the finished scripts, and rightfully rejected many, which ranged from James Wales' treatment that inserted religious aspects and felt too close to the previous three monster films, to more creative decisions like adding an invisible octopus. Eventually, after a constant back and forth with James Whale, with other directors coming and going frequently, he was locked in and brought his frequent collaborator, R.C. Sheriff, who made a direct adaptation of the novel, which was then approved by H.G. Wells himself, and gave audiences the most faithful adaptation any of the Universal Monsters would ever get. There are only minor differences between the novel and film, like the addition of a love interest for the Invisible Man and how he meets his final fate, but overall it stays fairly true to the source and is a largely faithful adaptation. With the script now approved and Wales signed on to direct, the only thing that was missing was the Invisible Man himself, as in the interim, Boris Karloff exited the project. In his search for a star, Whale knew that he needed one thing above all else, an unforgettable voice. This voice would come from little-known stage actor Cloud Rains, who had only one silent film from 1920 to his credit, and he had done a single screen test in which he felt that he had bombed horribly. But thankfully, Whale found his screen test and, hearing his potential, cast him in the leading role, launching Rain's soon-to-be magnificent career, including none other than Casablanca, reuniting him with Invisible Man cinematographer Arthur Edson. It might be a good idea for you to disappear from Casablanca for a while. There's a free French garrison over at Brazzaville. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. The Invisible Man serves as a wonderful centerpiece of sorts for the Universal Pictures monster flicks, as it is a departure from the five other films in almost every way. While each of the other films deal with pragmatic and often skeptical individuals who come into contact with supernatural forces beyond the realm of scientific reason, the Invisible Man now sees the monster as a man of science, encountering a deeply superstitious community, with the townspeople of Iping serving as a slapstick comedic foil to the brooding, constantly on edge Invisible Man. Tonally, the film is also unique, beginning with a much lighter tone, incorporating an ample amount of comedy, and gradually getting darker with less comedic elements and heavier drama as the story progresses. In this film, Arthur Edson photographs his subjects in a very classical style, lighting his leading actress in a very flattering way with a soft key light and very bright backlights. Whale also shows his mastery of staging and framing, separating his characters with physical objects like in this scene here. While green screens and editing software can now key out virtually anything, in 1933 the visual effects for The Invisible Man took a bit more ingenuity. For his reveals, Cloud Rains would wear black velvet over any exposed areas underneath his bandaging, which was then filmed against a black backdrop, then layered on top of the footage of the room that he was to appear in. In order to achieve the effect for this shot here in the mirror, four different elements were needed to be photographed in exactly the right positions. First, filming him from behind and then in front to use for the mirror, then his background, and then the background for the mirror. Now let's take a look at the visuals of another scene, and my favorite from the film, the Invisible Man's infamous reveal. The camera is placed in order to feel distant from the monster and create a sense of fear. 
It does this by keeping eye level with the police and the shop owners coming in through the door, with Griffin staged just slightly below camera and placed slightly farther away. Then when he stands, the camera is now angled on a medium shot placed below the Invisible Man, looking up to him as he stands, conveying a sense of power and menace to the character. It keeps his disconnected angling on him throughout the film, and generally placing the lights in a more dramatic way that, while not completely true to its established sources, looks gorgeous in a very classical style, something cinematographer Arthur Edson excels at, with large, soft key lights illuminating his bandaged face, and bright backlights playing off of the sides of his goggles. The Invisible Man is a truly unique film, even among other groundbreaking works of horror. The Invisible Man has left an impression on filmmakers and audiences alike that continues through to this day. Thank you for joining me on this look back at this classic film. I invite you to tune in next time as I continue my series on the monsters of Universal Pictures.